Hello and welcome to Florida Climate Week 2024 and today's presentation, Conservative Climate Leadership, Past and Present, featuring two former members of Congress, Representative Bob Inglis, who served the 4th Congressional District of South Carolina from 1993 to 1998 and again from 2004 to 2010 and uh, Representative Carlos Carrello, who served Florida's 26th Congressional District from 2015 to 2019. I'm Chelsea Henderson, and I'm the Director of Editorial, Con Editorial Content for RepublicEN.org, the eco-right-focused organization run by none other than Bob Inglis, um, which he runs to help recruit and applaud conservative climate leadership. I'm also the author of the recently released book, Glacial, The Inside Story of Climate Politics, which I bring up because we will talk a little bit about history today. So welcome to the program, Carlos and Bob. Great to be Thank with you. you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So I think that you both make interesting commentators on the evolution of climate denialism and the upswing toward hope because you each encountered the ebbs and flows on the issue of climate change at different times in your congressional careers and your subsequent careers since leaving office. And I was hoping that each of you could describe how past denialism imp impacts or affects your efforts today to bring conservatives to the table to be part of the climate change movement. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, I'll go. I'll go first since I'm older. And was there? <laughs> well, you're, I can tell the, you the pioneer. The pioneer. No, <laughs> I can tell you the old history, but really, Chelsea, you're the one that can tell us the whole history, having written this book, Glacial. But uh, <laughs> so, in my measuring life, here's the way it was. You know, in my first six years, I said climate change is nonsense. I didn't know anything about it except that Al Gore was for it. Um, okay, pretty ignorant, but that's the way it was my first six years in Congress. Out six years doing uh, commercial real estate law in Greenville, South Carolina, and then running again in 04, that's when my son challenged me saying, you know, uh, Dad, uh, you need to be different on this 2.0, English 2.0, and then a trip to Antarctica, and then being inspired by the faith of an Aussie climate scientist uh, and some science committee trips made me... Um, uh, become uh, this guy that's all hepped up about climate. But what's interesting is look at the look at the uh, my political life as a measuring of what you wrote about in Glacial uh, Chelsea. In 2004, when I was running again, I said that I would be all about energy security. I think the primary voters in Fourth District of South Carolina, a pretty conservative place, Greenville, Spartanburg, South Carolina, basically said that's sort of weird, but. Go ahead, Inglis. The economy's good, and we sort of we know you're all right. You're fine. Go back. So we won with uh, 85 percent of the primary vote that year. Okay, that was a brag. There's a humbling coming, <laughs> um, and then uh, then comes the Great Recession, you know. And it's all right, you know, as, as long as the economy was fine, people were fine with my focus on energy security. But then, October of 08, the wheels are coming off the financial system. You know, uh, banks were failing, insurance companies were failing, uh, houses were underwater financially, people were worried about their jobs. And so um, basically what happened was a lot of Republicans started taking the climate bead off of the worry strand. No need to worry about that one. And I think the primary voters were happy to hear that. No, yeah, don't, one less thing to worry about. I kept saying, no, well, well, we, could, we could do something about it. Uh, so I was out of step, right? And ended up losing in 2010, getting only 29% of the vote in a Republican runoff. So, um, but, uh, well, uh, and then, then, then pretty soon it's going to come Carlos's time. Um, but it's like this. I think Carlos may reflect the change of this. Because back then, when I was getting tossed out, those were the dark days of the Great Recession, really the worst time to be talking about climate change. So maybe Carlos picks up from there where it's particularly young conservatives are in a different spot. I, let's see what let's see what Carlos's history is. <laughs> yeah, Bob, well, thank you for your uh, your early leadership because really uh, there were few very few Republicans who um even uh, took any time to talk about this issue uh, when you started worrying about it and acting on it. Uh, I think that in terms of 
bipartisan dialogue uh, when I got to Congress in 2015, that was probably rock bottom. There were no conversations happening mm -hmm. between Republicans and Democrats uh, about this issue. And it's interesting, as Chelsea brings up denialism, which gets a lot of attention from the media. And certainly there, there are some uh, climate deniers who are in the Republican Party. But that uh, wasn't uh, the great challenge as far as I was concerned. The great challenge was apathy. Uh, most of the colleagues that I spoke to understood the science. They did not contest it, uh, but they didn't sense any urgency whatsoever. Uh, they didn't feel uh, the need to have any impetus whatsoever uh, in dealing with this issue. Uh, and certainly they they uh, perceived great political risk, uh, especially those who had served with you, right? So uh, that was really the greatest obstacle. And uh, that's why before taking bold action like you did, uh, the small number of us who who really did want to uh, make a difference on this issue said, we, we first need to break the ice here, which is probably not the best uh, uh, metaphor, uh, <laughs> but you get the idea. At least you we, weren't uh, melting the ice, right? You were just breaking yeah, it. <laughs> that's that's the the bad ice. We we do want that ice to melt. The, the ice that prevents bipartisan collaboration. <laughs> um, so we uh, we started this uh, climate solutions caucus, which was the first ever organization inside of Congress that uh, uh, was designed or built to deal with climate climate change in a bipartisan manner. And 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 that was the beginning of, uh, I think, a new era where now Republicans and Democrats, in a modest way, but I think in a meaningful way, have worked together on this issue to advance the clean energy transition, to recognize that government has a role in addressing climate change, that uh, Climate change isn't an issue uh, in it, just you know, a standalone issue. It's tied to the economy. It's tied to uh, our health. It's tied to American competitiveness. Uh, so uh, that that's kind of where we are now. And uh, even though I think we still have a long way to go, uh, we've seen um, some drastic changes uh, in the last five plus years. Uh, just recently, 18 House Republicans signed a letter saying, sure, we, we don't like the so-called Inflation Reduction Act. And I say so-called because it, it really had nothing to do with inflation, but our Democratic friends decided to call it that because it was convenient at the time. Uh, but 18 Republicans said, we, you know, we don't like this bill. We don't like the way it was passed. The, the Republican minority was completely shut out. Uh, however, there's some good in it. Uh, there's some clean energy tax credits that are resulting in major uh, infrastructure investments uh, throughout the country, especially in a lot of red districts. Uh, and uh, you know, it's it's been interesting to see how uh, different stakeholders from uh, the American Clean Power Association, which is you know a, a lot of power companies and and solar and wind uh, uh, developers to the American Petroleum Institute, uh, to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. A lot of usually right-leaning groups have also endorsed this idea, hey, this signature climate law, uh, we can change it, we can improve it, uh, but we don't want to just zero it out because there's a lot of good happening here. And essentially, it is a collective acknowledgement of the importance of the clean energy transition, the fact that uh, it cannot be stopped. No one should attempt to stop it. And uh, I think this this uh, this mentality, right, will continue uh, pushing us towards more bipartisan collaboration, a greater national consensus when it comes to this issue, to this cause uh, in our country. I want to hit on something you both said. So Carlos, you used the word apathy, which I think is a fantastic word to describe that um, lack of attention to action and to the issue at the time when you were serving. And Bob, you hit on the economy. And I'm wondering if, um, so, you know, 10 years ago and even five years ago, I think people tended to look at climate change as an environmental issue. 
And we have this misguided belief here in this country that you can't have a balance between the economy and the environment, right? The economy always has to come first when really the most economic prosperous nations are the ones that have the best environments typically. So looking at some of the climate impacts today, especially in your home state, Carlos, where the home insurance industry, for example, is collapsing under the weight of so many billions of dollars of claims due to storms. At what point does the economy become so tied into climate impacts that you break through that apathy, the, the apathy that still exists? We're coming out of that. We definitely see a little more action, as you noted, with the letter and so forth. But how, can we use the economic impacts of climate change to break down the remaining walls of apathy? Yeah, so the uh, Republican mayor of Miami, uh, I think probably the 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 only major uh, urban mayor who's Republican, I think maybe Oklahoma City too, but uh, he has a phrase which I'll borrow, uh, and that is the environment is the economy. And uh, that, that's true everywhere, but that's very evident in South Florida and, and really the whole state of Florida these days. Uh, insurance markets are really punishing this state. And that is a direct result of flooding, of uh, stronger storms. And by the way, these aren't even hurricanes in a lot of cases. We have gotten hit uh, by some hurricanes recently, but uh, in the mid 2000s, it, it, it was far worse. Uh, but these storms, are, uh, you know, that aren't even organized storms, uh, but you know they're causing a lot of flood damage. They're causing uh, some wind damage, and insurers are are leaving the state or driving up rates to the point where it's really hard for people uh, who are middle class, you know, people, teachers, firefighters, police officers, uh, to uh, to to live in this state. Uh, so the environment is the economy, and right now our economy in Florida by some measures, is doing very well. Everyone knows Florida got a great bounce during the pandemic. I think that uh, in terms of the pandemic, the state was managed uh, appropriately. But uh, the cost of insurance uh, is driving up the cost of real estate, uh, is driving up rents in the state. Uh, and that is having a very punishing effect on our residents. So uh, this is, uh, you know, this is you know, very obvious and uh, the more people connect the dots and it's going to become easier and easier to connect the dots every day, the more pressure uh, that our leaders are going to be under, Republican or Democrat, to meaningfully address this issue. And that means, of course, becoming more resilient, investing in infrastructure. Uh, maybe Florida is going to have to have a, a catastrophic fund to deal with storms that was proposed a long time ago. Uh, but we're also going to have to address the causes, right? And we know that, uh, at least in part, human activity is responsible for this. And we have to stop polluting the atmosphere uh, so that, uh, you know, we stop suffering uh, all these consequences, or at least we stop making things worse uh, here on the ground. Bob, I would be remiss if I didn't let you immediately respond with what in your and our view is the best um, policy mechanism to get at what Carlos was saying. We have to uh, account for the human caused activity, uh, the human activity that is causing climate change, which comes from emitting fossil fuels into the atmosphere. So have the floor, yeah. Bob. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, what we've got is sort of a corollary to what uh, Carlos was just quoting the mayor of uh, Miami for, is if uh, if the environment is the economy, the corollary to that that we use all the time is what we have here is a problem of economics that has an environmental consequence. Fix the economics. Um, and that's what we think is really the strong suit of actual conservatives, is to come forward with solutions that start with accountability you know um in our view at republicen.org that means um bringing accountability for dumping into the trash dump of the sky you know if you're if i'm english trash hauling in miami i go to the city dump and they charge me based on the weight of my trucks and i pass that 
cost back to my customers. Totally appropriate, right? That's uh, everybody thinks conservative and progressives all say, well, that makes sense. English trash hauling is filling up the Miami city dump. Um, and uh, so we got to build an up, a new dump once English trash hauling fills us up. So let's have a nice one that's lined and everything. So we're going to charge English trash hauling for dumping in the Miami Dade dump. And so um, why don't we do that in the trash dump of the sky? It's basically what we're asking at republician.org. Why don't we just put a price on pollution? And if you do that and apply that price to imports, that's the key. Um, then you get the whole world in on this thing. And Carlos, what I'm finding now is that, you know, back in the dark days that I was describing in those, those earlier times, uh, is basically aggressive disbelief about climate. It's sort of like, I don't believe in climate change and you shouldn't either. Um, is basically what conservatives were telling me circa 2010. I think that's changed. Um, you know, now you have conservatives really stopping the argument with thermometers, as our friend Catherine Hayhoe says, you know, and stopping to argue about the water coming up in places like Miami. Um, what they're looking for is a worldwide solution, and they realize that that's a big challenge. Um, and so that's why we think this pricing mechanism that you can read all about at republicen.org um, uh, really can make it so this goes worldwide and fix economics and the environment will take care of itself. Yeah, Bob, and I think this uh, this solution, which is the most logical solution, and by the way, the most conservative solution too, because our friends on the other side would probably opt for very aggressive regulation, uh, right. arbitrary taxes on specific industries. Uh, we don't think any of that makes sense. We we already have a lot of that and it, it doesn't work very well. But uh, we all know that there's going to be a big tax debate in Congress next year. No matter who wins, there's going to be a big tax debate. Uh, a lot of the provisions of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which I helped write uh, in the 115th Congress, are are set to expire at the end of next year and decisions will have to be made. So uh Hopefully, and, and I think there's there's a chance uh, that this this policy solution, right, putting a price on pollution, making sure we take pollution into account in the economy, uh, given its potential to uh, raise a lot of revenue and help alleviate other taxes, perhaps. Uh, I think uh, I think there, it, it may have uh, yet another moment and. Uh, you know, who knows whether it'll pass or not, uh, but I certainly hope that it uh, is in the discussion. And I think thanks to groups like Republican, it will be in the discussion. And, um, you know, there is a, uh, a member of the Ways and Means Committee who happens to be a Republican who does support uh, this kind of solution, Brian Fitzpatrick of Pennsylvania. So we'll have to wait and see, but we know uh, that next year uh, Congress is going to want to extend tax cuts. And we know we have a massive deficit in this country, which we conservatives have been talking about for a long time. I think everyone is starting to pay at least some attention to now because it's just grown so much and the debt is now over $35 trillion. So, uh, We'll see, but I think uh, I think this uh, this policy instrument is going to be in the game here pretty soon again. Yeah, um, and Carlos, you, you know, is, is something to follow up on that is how do we restore trust? You know, what we're what we talk about at RepublicEN.org is is yes, pricing carbon dioxide with a carbon tax, so that terrible word, <laughs> uh, but then pairing it with a reduction of other taxes. But here's a problem. People don't believe us. <laughs> they don't believe that it'd be paired with a reduction. How do we overcome that distrust? That's that's sort of the crucial thing of our moment is we, we're, we're really in these divided camps where we, we, we don't believe that the other side could possibly have good intentions. And so well, somehow, how do we- Yeah, how I do mean, I think through? that's why, number one, the policy solution has to be as simple as possible. It has to be very easy to explain. I think one of the challenges with cap and trade is that it's it, it's a little complicated, right? I can pollute and pay someone else, and it's just uh, 
um, I, 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 I think people got lost. I think if there's a simple fee on pollution, and then the other question is, what is it paired with, right? Well, we're going to, I don't know, you know, people who are in Congress will decide, but we'll reduce taxes for uh, families who make less than X amount, or uh, we'll reduce other uh, kinds of taxes. Uh, may, maybe you know, one of my ideas was, hey, let's get rid of the, the gasoline tax. Once we're pricing pollution in a, in a fair and comprehensive way, we, we don't need all these extra taxes. Who knows? We may not even need tax incentives uh, to the same degree for clean energy, right? Because they would in some way be duplicative. So uh, we'd have to show, uh, I think, a very simple policy solution paired probably with uh, some popular uh, policy solutions, right? Which tax reduction tends to be uh, very popular. So I think that's the way uh, we build trust. And, and since you bring up trust, I'll say, I think you're out there in a lot of American communities trying to build trust and, and build relationships. Uh, what I've focused on a lot post-Congress is trying to build trust within the institution. Uh, amongst Republicans and Democrats and outside stakeholders, key stakeholders. So a lot of the work we do is convening, bringing people together, just helping them to get to know each other, which is one of the big problems in D.C. People are attacking and saying really nasty things about people who they've never even sat with. They they, they don't know anything about them beyond their names and, and the letter that uh, – that, that comes after their names. So uh, I think we have to build trust both with the American people and also inside the Congress so that uh, when policymakers do decide to take a bold step, uh, the American people see that they're doing so together and that uh, they're um, you know, speaking with the same voice uh, and, and can be trusted to act uh, in favor of a solution that the American people need. You have both touched on the importance of bipartisanship, and I think the best example that illustrates the need for bipartisanship is the Inflation Reduction Act post-implementation that you mentioned, Carlos, with this letter of 18 GOP house, uh, house lawmakers saying, don't, don't roll back the whole bill because there's a lot in it that we like. Right. And that bill did have a lot of standalone Republican priorities included in it. But the process of passing the bill as a whole was a hyperpartisan process called budget reconciliation for those uh, watching our program, listening to our program who haven't um, delved into how that bill passed. And so it was passed with only Democratic support. So with that and this need for things to be bipartisan so that they can be durable, how do we ensure that if they, when they reopen um, the tax negotiations in the next Congress, again, regard, we don't know what the outcome of the election will be, but we know that the tax cuts that were passed under President Trump will expire in 2025, so there'll have to be a discussion around that. If there is a discussion on pricing carbon, how do we ensure that that is a bipartisan discussion so that it becomes a provision that has some durability and some longevity? Yeah, I personally, I think that major policy questions should not be addressed through the budget reconciliation process. And this is very technical for our viewers. Uh, the budget reconciliation process is is just a technical uh, uh, instrument inside the Congress used to lower the threshold in the Senate to pass a bill uh, with 51 votes instead of 60. So uh, essentially, uh, I, I don't know, you know, throughout history, but in, in modern history, uh, budget reconciliation has been used as an instrument to lock out the minority party in the Senate. Uh, and it's used when one party controls both houses of Congress. So if we're going to address major policy questions like climate, the environment and energy, social security, uh, national defense, I don't think that the reconciliation process should be used because it it has come to mean that we are intentionally excluding the minority party. So uh, whatever we do, uh, ideally it would be bipartisan in the House. 
and certainly it should be bipartisan in the Senate. Uh, and, and, and we see how that works. I mean, Congress passed an infrastructure bill uh, last Congress. No one's out there criticizing it. No one's out there attacking it. No one's out there threatening to bring it down if they take power. Why? Because it was done in a bipartisan manner. Uh, Bob mentioned uh, Al Gore earlier. I have nothing against Al Gore's advocacy for the environment. You know, he, he's dedicated a lot of life to it, and, uh, and that's admirable. What I do criticize about Al Gore is the fact that he did not uh, recruit a Republican partner uh, to, together with him, become the faces of American environmentalism. You know, Bob mentioned his uh, his first uh, few terms in Congress. So Al Gore was for it. You know, we're against it. I mean, that's just how it was after the very contentious 2000 election, right? Which, by the way, was a walk in the park compared to the elections, presidential <laughs> elections we have these days. But back then, it was extremely divisive. And the the, the man who, who came, you know, uh, fell short became the face of, of American environmentalism. And I think that did a lot of damage. Uh, to to the cause of of the environment because it it really deepened polarization. I know Newt Gingrich had a big role in it before that, but uh, certainly uh, if you know it was Al Gore and a Republican out there, I, I don't think uh, things would have gotten this badly. So yes, uh, in in my view, the only way forward on this topic is through bipartisan action. As we wrap up this segment, I, you know, as Bob knows very well, just wrote this wonderful, I think, in my mind book on the history of climate politics. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, who are the climate heroes of the past? And so a climate hero from the past, but also how about a climate hero that can take us into the future from each of you? And I know I'm putting you on the spot because I did not prep you that I would be asking this question. And maybe I'll go first um, to give you time to think. Um, my climate hero from the past is actually um, Senator Joe Lieberman, who was a through line um, in my book. I, I realized when I started to do the research, cared about this issue before he reached the U.S. Senate. And then once he got there, understood that to... He, he actually, this is kind of funny, he asked, his number one committee request was to be on the Environment and Public Works Committee, which is not a super A committee. So for somebody to come in and want that as their first choice, they were like, okay, sure, you can have that, Joe. Um, but then he got to be on that committee and use his power there to um, try to sway folks on climate change and, and keep the issue alive. And he always worked with a Republican um, co-sponsor. So as you were saying, Carlos, about uh, the former vice president, Lieberman understood that, right? That you had to have somebody from the other side. And I think, you know, looking toward the future, I am just gonna give kind of a collective um, uh, champion or superhero. And, and I think that is Gen Z, you know, they are climate native. It doesn't matter what party they belong to. They understand that this is an issue. I don't wanna saddle them with all the weight of solving it because we are both all young and vibrant and capable of, of being part of the solution as well. So that's my response. I'll turn it over to you guys for your thoughts. Carlos, you, you, who, who's your, who, your, who are your Bob people? Bob needs to think more. <laughs> Look, I, 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 I gotta go, looking back, I gotta go with our pioneer, Bob Inglis, who, uh, oh. who took, a, took a big bullet. Uh, you know, I, cause Bob, I, I never got punished politically for my uh my engagement on this issue on the contrary i outperformed every republican on the ticket in 2018 when i won and i was not even challenged uh in a primary at least not in a meaningful way uh bob was he 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 did um uh you know this issue did cost him his his seat in congress so um i i, I don't there's no question for me uh, looking back, we should be looking forward. I'll I'll, um, I'll highlight two people: uh, John Curtis uh, of Utah. John is um, a congressman from Utah. He's going to be uh, the next uh, senator from Utah, uh, replacing Mitt Romney. Uh, his contributions to this cause have been extraordinary. He uh, 
you know, when I was in Congress, I focused on the centrist Republicans and and trying to get them on board with this issue. Uh, John has focused on the entirety of the House Republican Conference, and he uh, has recruited a lot of very conservative members to at least acknowledge the issue and uh, express a willingness to work on it. And that's that's very important. And then uh, leading the more centrist um, House Republicans these days is Andrew Garbarino, who's chairing, co-chairing the uh, the caucus that I co-founded with Ted Deutsch, the House uh, Climate Solutions Caucus. Uh, he's really, um, you know, revitalized the caucus because after the 2018 election, the Republican side was decimated. And he has uh, done a lot to educate members and, and help members uh, think and act uh, with more ambition when it comes to this issue. Yeah. And so I'll send you the $20 for every, see, every time Carlos. Oh, I thought it was going to be a little more than that. I thought it was, you know, <laughs> no, it's $20 per buy, time. Buy inflation, right? You $25. <laughs> anyway, but my two, uh, my two are soon to be history, not yet history, two senators, uh, one just mentioned Mitt Romney, uh, who is leaving the Senate, but he's willing to speak on climate. And the other leaving the Senate to run for governor in Indiana is Mike Braun, uh, who's been willing to lead on climate. And uh, so, Chelsea, when you write a new chapter of the book or the addendum, when we solve this thing, you're probably going to be writing about, uh, I don't know, adding whatever uh, people like John Curtis do in the Senate and uh, and uh, and uh, something about how these relationships that Carlos helped to build will create that consensus. Um, so we're waiting for the addendum to Glacial. Yeah, um, where, we'll need the, we the second it. printing, right? We'll have the what now chapter and hopefully there is a great chapter to tell with um, a pricing carbon mechanism done in the next Congress in a very bipartisan way and continued leadership um, from the eco right, um, which is the community that that we all three of us are are part of and leaders in, and I thank you both so much for participating in today's conversation on conservative leadership and for your individual leadership through the years, and of course moving on into the future. Thank you, Chelsea. Thanks, Chelsea. Thanks, Carlos. See ya. See y'all soon.